Okay, I think we're going to start now. Uh, so hello, everybody here in the center. Hello, everybody online. Uh, and we've got today the culmination of our series on the four reminders. So the whole autumn, we've been going through this Tibetan teaching of the four reminders. And as a culmination, uh, we're very, very pleased to have Pranya Devi uh, speaking here. Um, you have spoken at North London before, haven't you? But not for a little while, I think. Anyway, not for a long time anyway, yes. Branya Dave is based in London. Uh, she's originally from Holland uh, and she's an experienced uh, order member who works as an acupuncturist, is that right? Um, so she's also involved with uh, holistic medicine uh, as well as with uh, a lot of uh, teaching of Buddhism. Uh, so it's great to have her here. Um, and uh, in healing, healing, of course, you're noticing that people are not uh, completely well. Um, and you're also uh, in Buddhism noticing that the world is not completely well. And I, uh, that may be an aspect, I'm not quite sure, of Pranya Devi's talk today, because the first reminder uh, back at the beginning of the autumn, if you can cast your minds back to then, was the preciousness of this human life. And then the second reminder, although we did these slightly out of order, is impermanence, is to realize that we have this wonderful opportunity as human beings, uh, but it won't last forever. Uh, and so it's important to recognize that uh, things are changing and to see again what is positive in change, not to feel that it's always just loss, uh, not to feel that it's always just uh, bereavement effectively, although of course there are a lot of things like that. And then the third reminder uh, is the reminder that it makes a difference what you do, actions have consequences, karma. Uh, so in other words, we do have some potency. We don't just have to be swept along by the winds of change. Uh, we can intervene in our own lives and we can intervene in the world. So those are the three reminders we've had so far. Uh, and the talk uh, today by Pranya Devi uh, is entitled Where the Light Gets In. Now, uh, I'm a little bit cautious as to what to say about that because I suspect it's a reference to a Leonard Cohen song. Is that something? Oh, she's, she's not, she's being very non-committal uh, on that. It may or may not be. Uh, but I know that there is this wonderful image, it seems to me, that uh, there's a crack in the world, but that crack is the crack where the light gets in. Uh, so in other words, that there are things wrong and we have to recognize that the world is a very imperfect place. We're going through a big pandemic crisis at the moment. There are many other things, uh, the bre problems with Brexit and lots of other things being wrong. Um, but it may be that in the very problems that the world is facing, uh, that we find light coming through. Uh, myself, I had my bike stolen last night. Someone broke into my cycle shed. Uh, earlier in the week, I, I lost a crown from one of my teeth. And, uh, you know, these are very minor things, but I'm sure all of you have experienced many trials and tribulations this year. Um, but let's see though, whether we can find uh, some light there. And I'm going to hand over now to Pranya Devi. Uh, so where the light comes in. Thank you, Ratna Prabha. <laughs> It's, um, it's really nice to be at the center. I've not been here since early February for an order weekend. So it's, um, it's really nice to see people three-dimensionally. So lovely to see you all. And also hello to everyone tuning in at home, wherever you are. Yes, this morning, today, going to look at the, um, the fourth of the four reminders or the uh, mind-turning reflections, as they're also known. And as Ratna Prabha mentioned, they are the defects of samsara, or the faults of samsara. Well, first of all, they remind us because we need reminding. That's um, maybe, maybe stating the obvious, but uh, we need reminding that... Um, the, world, the way we see our world is imperfect. And they're mind-turning reflections because by reflecting on these truths, these dharmic truths, we can turn our mind from outside, so finding pleasure or satisfaction outside ourselves, to turning it within, turning it within our own mind, turning it towards a dharma path. So that's the, that's the turning aspect of the um, mind-turning reflections. 
So these are all fundamental truths. They're actually truths you can't really argue with. The fact that um, life is fleeting, the fact that we're all going to die, we, that's the one certainty we have, whatever happens between now and then, but that's what we know to be true. The fact that actions have consequences, we kind of know that, but um, yeah, we don't always act accordingly. And I think that's where the, the discrepancy is. So the faults of samsara, just to sort of define what samsara is actually, for those of you who are unfamiliar with that word, it's really the way we see the world. So we have our experience through wrong views or through unenlightened an unenlightened perspective. Let's call it that way. So we are very much looking at the world or experiencing the world through not being enlightened. So we experience life as um, imperfect, so there is suffering. There's suffering because there is suffering, that's a given. That's also the first noble truth, if you're familiar with that, that life is suffering. And then there's also the suffering that we add to it by um, making stories about what is going on, sort of embellishing it in some ways, or uh, yeah, ruminating. So in that way, uh, life is imperfect to us. And the main default of samsara really is that we put ourselves at the center of things, that we tend to see life or the world um, through our particular viewpoint with ourselves at the center. So even though we can experience life as, uh, well, as suffering, um, it, it's, it's from our very subjective point of view how we experience life. And as we may know from the wheel of life that our lives are, we are driven on the whole by craving and aversion and ignorance. If you're familiar with the wheel of life, those are the three things at the hub of the, of the wheel that drives all of human existence, drives all of um, our lives. The fact that we, well, we don't really know what's true a lot of the time. And the fact that we are either drawn to things or averse to things in life, that's our response to whatever happens to us. It's either neutral, although never neutral for very long. And then we either want it or we don't want it. Sort of in, in very sort of crude terms, that's pretty much our, how we live our lives. So we want more of what we, um, we like, what we feel attracted to. And we want less of that which we don't feel attracted to, which we're averse to, or things that don't make us happy. That's um, kind of how we operate. So the I is, is the, the ego project. So the default of samsara is really that we are almost in the way of actually seeing things as they are. We, we experience life through our own eyes, through our own imperfect view of um, the world, of experience. We're kind of delusional. Uh, and we're all in it uh, together. You know, I think that's kind of what makes it harder to see because we're all in that same boat. We're all in that same boat of samsara. We're all heading for death, basically. Um, but while we are heading for death, which is the one certainty in our lives, we, we're still trying to make life, make samsara as uh, pleasant or as um, satisfying as possible. And we can, in doing that, we can either compare ourselves to others, find ourselves less or better than others, for instance, um, which in a way, comparison can be a good thing because you can aspire to particular quality, say, that someone else has that you'd feel you'd like to have more of. But very often, comparison also serves to 
either elevate us or downgrade ourselves to a different status. And all of this is seeing life through unenlightened eyes, because that is not really how it works. So samsara is um, a warped view of the world. That's how we see samsara. That's, that's in a way what um, informs our experience, that we are central and we operate very much through aversion or um, attraction. And this creates um, separation. This creates a lot of separation in us, between us and others, but also within ourselves. We can kind of battle with ourselves. We are um, sort of caught in a particular habitual patterns of our own mind most of the time, uh, unless we become more aware of what those habitual patterns are. We're very much sort of caught by that and driven by um, these patterns in our mind. So the reminders are actual fundamental truths, fundamental truths that you can't really argue with. And I remember when I first came across Buddhism or the Dharma, just like over 30 years ago, that was, um, that was like a relief to me to see things put in that perspective. See that actually life is suffering. Yes, there is suffering. You can't really do much about that fact that is true, but we can do something about how we respond to what is going on in our lives. The more aware, the more integrated we are, the more we can actually respond more skillfully, kindly to what is going on, what is coming on our path. And perhaps this year, more than any other in my lifetime, has been um, challenging for, for many of us. And for many of us, our plans have pretty much, uh, well, gone by the wayside for this year. Don't know if there's anyone who's, for whom the year panned out just as they expected. I don't think there's, <laughs> there's really anybody. Um, and this has been, this is in a way the first crack uh, we can see in the world. This is the first crack we can see is that actually we make our plans, we have our ideas about what we'd like to do, and then it's all coming to now because there's a, there's a pathogen going around the world, um, you know, basically creating havoc. And we cannot really do what we would like to do. We have to adapt. Then it is our response to how we deal with that how we deal with the fact that our plans are not really going um, the way we'd hoped. And I can imagine that depends on the kind of plans you may have. So if you're planning to get married, for instance, this year, I think that's a sort of bigger disappointment than maybe if you were thinking of a holiday somewhere. Either way, we have to kind of adapt to um, reality. And this has been a real good practice this year for me and for, for many of us to actually really take it as it comes and not even being able to have very much in terms of plans, but um, just responding to what's there, responding to what's there every day. This pandemic has really brought that home, I think, more than, than normal, when we can still pretend a lot of the time that um, well, we just can do what we set out to do. And um, usually we can make it work for ourselves. And if it doesn't work, it's a bit of an inconvenience or a disappointment, but we'll, we'll get on to the next thing. And this year has very much thrown that up in the air, where it's pretty hard to really plan anything. And every time we do, um, well, for instance, I thought at the beginning of this year that, well, by July, we'd be out of the woods. And I don't know if any of you were quite that optimistic, but um, clearly it's December now and uh, we're not anywhere near being out of the woods, I would say. So to have the um, 
have the four reminders as a dharmic perspective on life turns things around so from switches things the way we see things rather than thinking well here's life and bad things happen and I'm just trying to make the best of it I'm just trying to do the best I can there's a there's a shift it may be a bit subtle but actually quite profound to realize that suffering is just part of life it's a given we can't avoid it no matter how hard we try things will not work out we will lose um, people dear to us. We will lose things like jobs or positions or status. Um, there's not much we can do about it. But we have, when we have that perspective and we have more of a dharmic perspective, we know this is true. Somehow our perspective can become a bit bigger. We're sort of less involved in our own ego project. We're a bit less concerned with how we can make things good and pleasant for ourselves in our own little orbit, um, but actually see that things are not going according to plan necessarily. And that in a way, the fact of having a plan or having ideas is really what causes havoc rather than the plans going awry. If you see what I mean, it's more a view of um, wanting a certain outcome, wanting things to go a certain way. That is what is wrong with the world. So in a way, the world is just the world. Our experience is just our experience. But the way we um, argue with reality a lot of the time is what is the problem. That is really what is the problem. And this fourth reminder is there to basically, again, remind us, remind us that that's how it is. And that a lot of the time, if we argue with reality, if we argue with what is actually true, we cause ourselves a lot of pain and hurt on top of the pain and hurt that's all there. It's almost like we're making it worse. It's not if you're familiar with the, the analogy of the arrows where the first arrow is shot and it hurts. And then we start to make a story about who shot the arrow, what we're going to do about it. And that's the second arrow that we cause ourselves. It's the second sort of injection of pain and suffering that we bring about ourselves. If we could just stay with what's painful or what's difficult or unsatisfying, um, it would just be that. It would be painful, difficult, unsatisfying, knowing from the first, from the reminders that things are transitory, knowing that also it won't last. It will pass like anything and everything else will pass. So a dharmic perspective, um, having that as a bedrock of our experience, not not see, seeing the world in a different way, seeing it as um, it's just unfolding, it's just happening. Here we are, don't know how we, how we got here, but here we are, and we're just living our lives, it's just unfolding, and we can have that perspective, that dharmic perspective of what is true, the fact it's transitory, the fact that actions of consequences, the fact that life is actually a lot of the time unsatisfactory, not giving us what we'd hoped for, perhaps. Knowing that that is true can kind of make us relax a little bit more rather than feeling we need to grasp for the ultimate happiness, the, um, the more satisfying relationship, the job, whatever. And it's not that one shouldn't aim for that, that one shouldn't sort of have that. It's more that we can cling to it. It's more that we can sort of grasp onto it in a way that actually is like the second arrow. It's what causes the pain. When we cling to what we really want, what we really want, want to hold on to it, that's what causes pain because things will pass. 
relationships pass, people die. Does that sound all a bit um, dark and dim? Does that, <laughs> does that sort of give you a sense of, well, what's the point? Um, I hope not, because actually there's a really positive side to this. There's a real freedom in realizing what is true. There's a real freedom in holding a bigger perspective. There's a freedom in having a different attitude to life, having a different attitude to what is going on, what's coming on our path. Because we're not fixed on a particular outcome, we're not fixed on a particular result. We just can go with the flow a bit more. We can have set our goals. We can have a purpose, of course. It's important to have a purposeful life. But then also not hold on to it too tightly. I think a lot of the practice is in that, not to hold on too tightly. Have a slightly lighter touch. So the default of samsara is being... Um, unsatisfactory um, yeah it brings me to the practice of ethics because there's something about just being able to practice ethics Buddhist ethics that will clear our mind that will um, free us up if we are unkind, for instance, or unskillful, either towards ourselves or towards others, it, it has a consequence. We know it has, a, it has an effect. And very often, if we check in with ourselves, we can feel this, the result of, say, unskillful actions or um, unkind behavior, either towards ourselves or towards others. It's almost like it's kind of settling somewhere almost in our body, almost in our energy. And when we can act kindly and skillfully, um, there, is a, there is a release, there is a relief of, um, yeah, that frees us up. So living an ethical life is, um, is quite important. It's kind of fundamental to being able to see this unsatisfactory of samsara and hold it lightly, that we don't have the consequences of unskillful actions. Um, I was uh, standing in a queue the other day outside the post office, my local post office, um, waiting for it to open at 9 a.m. And there was already quite a queue and uh, for the fourth time in two weeks that I was standing in the queue waiting for it to open at 9 a.m., the post office didn't open at 9 a.m. They just went there. Um, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. It was quite cold and a lot of people were, it was quite a queue, a lot of people standing there. And the fourth time that I was having this experience, um, I found myself getting more wound up you know, I found myself just wanting it to be different, basically, wanting them to turn up and open shop. Um, and behind me was this elderly woman, and she was uh, leaning on her shopping trolley, clutching a letter. And she was mumbling behind her face mask, like, I thought they were supposed to open at nine. I said, yes, but they're not. And I thought, you know, what I need to do is um, file a complaint with the post office to just uh, to say, you know, they're just not opening on time. This is the fourth time in two weeks. I was starting to feel quite sort of um, righteous about it. Um, and then I thought, I can do that right now on my mobile, just sort of, you know, type in a little complaint to the post office. And as I was doing that, there was a woman behind the older woman who said to the <laughs> to her, to the older woman, she said, Oh, are you just posting a letter, love? I'll, I'll do it for you. I'll take it in. You go home. You'll be warm. And she said, oh, oh, thank you. Thank you. That's really kind. So she handed her the letter and uh, trotted off home to be in the warmth. 
And to me, that was a real sort of instance of like, ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> My response, um, even though well-meant, wasn't quite the one, you know, wasn't quite the one. And the response of the woman in the queue who offered to post a letter, that was, that was a compassionate response. That was a kind response to, um, to someone standing in the cold for 20 minutes waiting for the post office to open. So my life is um, full of these kind of incidents where, you know, I always think I could, I could act kinder, I could act more skillfully, I could, I could act more compassionately. If only I would sort of leave myself out of it a little bit and sort of see what's actually needed here, rather than it being part of my ego project and thinking, you know, a bit righteous, I've got to make a complaint here. For the, for the benefit of everyone in the queue. Although in that very moment, of course, that wasn't really going to solve anything. And I still haven't had a reply, by the way. Yeah, so the ego project. Um, oh, yeah, we're at it all the time, aren't we? And um, it's, it's a bit like we can make samsara comfortable for ourselves, knowing what we know, knowing that life is fleeting, knowing that um, it comes to an end and uh, we can still try and make the best of it and make it as comfortable as possible. But still, there's us, there's the I at the center of it. There's just I making it comfortable for myself, make it more palatable for myself. It's a bit like moving the furniture, getting new furniture into the room, but you're still in the same room. And we're very much still, we're very much still in that same boat, all of us. We're in that same boat, heading for, <laughs> um, for death, basically, not to put a finer point on it. And um, how can we, how can we sort of see that, recognize it? Because I said before, it's harder to see that because we're all in it. So it's, it's, hard, it's almost harder to take a stand, to sort of step away from that, step back from that a little bit, get a perspective on life and what's happening and, uh, and see it through that dharmic perspective of what is true, even though people around you don't. That's almost more challenging because it's very compelling to, well, just make life while it lasts very comfortable in a way, again, nothing wrong with making life comfortable in itself. But if that is an end in itself, then you're limiting yourself. We are limiting ourselves. So um, in order to transcend or go beyond that ego project, we need a bigger project. We need to serve something that is greater than just our own purpose in life of where we want to get to. We need to realize that we're all interconnected, that we are not entities on our own, that we're not just um, living our lives while other people live their lives in our own little cells. Because that is often the view we can have. And the more involved we are, with ourselves and our own um, things, goings on, uh, the less we can see that, the less we can see that actually we're all in it together. And we can um, see ourselves mirrored in others and see others uh, are mirrored in us. We are all very much connected and like in the Metta Bhavna, it's only if we can act from a point of view of, uh, come from a point of compassion for ourselves and for others, is that we can start to feel that connection. Because what drives us all, beyond um, craving and aversion, is actually, I wish to be happy. I wish to um, feel good, really. That's on a very basic level, what drives us. So to have a bigger perspective, a dharmic perspective, is um, 
is crucial if we want to grow and develop. It's crucial to see that our views, the way we view ourselves, the way we view the world, um, is wrong a lot of the time. Because we're, it's informed by wrong views. It's informed by what we want from it or what we um, don't want from it. There's, there's always a separation uh, going on. So it's our attitude that needs to shift. So samsara, as opposed to nirvana, sort of the enlightened bit, it's not a different place. It's not like it's somewhere else. It's not like we just need to go through a particular door and there we are, everything suddenly beautiful and hunky-dory. It's in ourselves. It's within us. It's, it's our... Um, it's our attitude, it's our view of the world and our either reactive mind or more open mind, seeing what actually comes our way and responding to it with kindness. That makes the difference. So the mind-turning reflections are to turn our minds inwards, to turn our minds towards our own mind, because it's the only thing we can learn to control in the world. The only thing. We can try and control um, other people. I think it's a big project for many of us, trying to make people behave in a way that you know, works better for us or we think might work better for them. But actually, uh, to go beyond that is really what's required to have a bigger perspective, to um, have a dharmic perspective on life and on our experience is what will take us out of that ego project, which will make us just a little bit less holding on to it, less holding on to what we individually want. If we can recognize that what we all want is actually freedom, ultimately, freedom from suffering, freedom of mind, freedom of repetitive, repetitive unhelpful patterns, freedom from um, thoughts that just keep us going round and round in the same circles, when we can see that that is what keeps us bound, when we can see that, in a way, opening up a little bit, we can see sort of cracks in that view that we have. That is where the light comes in. That is where the truth shines through. The Dharma is true. You can't really argue with it. We may try. And I found that liberating when I first came across that, that the Dharma was just true. I, I, I had no case against it. I still don't. But it's, um, it takes time and it's not so easy to necessarily align ourselves with what is true in life. We, we, part of the problem is that we very often are in opposition to ourselves even. Um, repetitive mind cycles, unskillful thoughts that go round and round are all habits that can be hard to get out of, can be hard to, to stop. But having the, the bedrock of the um, four mind-turning reflections can help us see through that, can help us see the, um, in a way, the error of our views, where, where we see things as wrong. Things are not going to last forever. Although, of course, we may, we very well act like it. This is where we are kind of in opposition to what is true. We know we're going to die, yet we don't know it. We know other people are going to die, our parents, friends. Yet when they do, 
it comes as such a shock. It's so hard often to reconcile ourselves with that. If we have a bigger perspective and we know that's going to happen to all of us, something opens up a little bit more. Um, yeah, turning towards our own mind to, um, to work with our own mind, our, our own reactivity in our mind, our own kind of unskillful reactions to what happens to us in life is, um, is where it's at. That's where the mind turns, turns towards our own ability to actually work with that to see things for what they are and to call out untruths, to ask ourselves, is it true? I always find that a very good question to ask ourselves, is it true? Yeah, the, the, um, these reflections are really designed to, you know, really put our nose right up close to what is reality, what is true. They're actually designed to take us away from distraction. Well, our, our whole life is a distraction, you could say, while we're chasing um, very pretty mundane things, we are distracted from what we really need to do. And the mind turning reflections are to help us turn towards what's true and apply it to our own lives to to have that perspective. As Ryokan said, um, if you want to, if you're pointing your cart south and you want to go north, uh, I'm not quite sure that's, that's the order of how he said it, but basically, if you want to go somewhere, if you've got a particular purpose in life, you want to follow the Dharma path, but you're going in the opposite direction, you're not going to get there. So we need to align ourselves with what we believe to be true, with what's our ideal. We need to align ourselves with that. And for that, we need a lot of compassion. We need a lot of compassion to tap into for ourselves and for others. Without that, we're not really going to get very far at all. And we need our spiritual friends. It's very hard to live the Dharma life by yourself. I don't know people can do it, that they might, must be exceptional. I think on the whole, we need people who are with us, especially because we are in a world where everyone is, um, yeah, living life in a particular way, going after values that may not be Dharmic values. To have friends in, on the spiritual path is um, priceless, it's crucial, it's essential to remind us. So to make our lives purposeful, to have the Dharma as our leading light, and that light that comes through when we see through our own wrong views, the way we experience life. That is, in a way, as we see that more and more, it's a, it's a gradual, it's an organic process. It's not something we can make ourselves do. So it's an it's a organic process. And the more we use that perspective, the more we apply that, look at the world through that lens, um, the more natural it becomes to us. It just becomes a more natural way of living our lives. That way we can see more quickly, more, but sooner um, when our response or our view of the world is wrong. You know, if we can ask ourselves that is, that, is that true? So there is a crack in everything, true enough, as Leonard Cohen said. And there are many cracks in the way we see the world. 
And if we can see those cracks, that is how the light gets in and illuminates our Dharma path for today. <laughs>